Welcome. We're so glad that you're here to be a part of this Courageous Conversations webinar. My name is Shannon Beck and I work in World Mission um, for you all. My job is as a reconciliation catalyst and a part of our work is to engage you all with the work that our global partners are doing around issues of anti-violence work. One piece that came up as we were polling global partners and national partners around the work that mattered the most to them and they are most engaged with, with was uh, violence against women and children. So we began this campaign, Stop Up, Speak Up, Stop Sexual Violence, to, as a way to connect you all with the work that's being done around the world and with each other. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the bravery it takes to be willing to take on a topic like this. Um, and I would just like to let you know what's going to be happening uh, for this webinar briefly. And uh, then I will turn it over to uh, our, our panelists. After we do a basic, this basic introduction, uh, Patrick, Aaliyah, who works here in the office, will do some housekeeping. And then um, we are grateful to have uh, stated clerk Grady Parsons with us today to offer some opening remarks. Following that, Russ Funk of the Center for Women and Families and Men's Work will be sharing with us. After his presentation, we'll have a few more words from Grady and ways to engage this in a more practical way. And then there will be time for questions and answers. So again, thank you so much for being here. And I will kick it over to Patrick to share with you some of the details. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, as Shannon mentioned, uh, near the end of our webinar time today, it'll be the opportunity for a question and answer session. Uh, so we would encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar uh, as they come to mind. And so as you see on your screen now, uh, there's a box where you can submit your questions. And I would also encourage you that if you have any technical uh, issues arise during the webinar, please enter them into the same question box and I'll do my best to get those resolved for you uh, as we go on. So without any further ado, I'll pass things over to Grady Parsons, stated clerk of the Office of the General Assembly. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, let's begin in good church fashion. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we thank you that you call us to be the church, that you call us to care for each other. You call us to be a respecter of people and a repairer of the breach. And we ask now you be with us as we have this conversation, a uh, hard conversation, tough conversation, but a conversation we need to have as a church. One of the reasons this, uh, this issue means so much to me is that in the 15 years that I was a pastor, I had a, a young woman and her family came to me, and she had been raped uh, when she was on a trip. And what I realized uh, in that the experience is that I really wasn't equipped to uh, be of help to her or even to help her tell her story, and nor was my church. If she had come to me and said she had cancer, if she had come to me and said that she was having a breakup in a marriage, if she would come to me and asked me something about John Calvin, <laughs> I'd have been ready, and the church would have been ready. Uh, but this was not something that we were ever prepared to talk about or to be ready for. This was a, this was a hurt that most people had to endure by themselves. And to me, that's just the opposite of what the church should be about. So uh, anything we can do, I think, uh, to open ourselves up so that we can not only help people who are victims, but also help those people who, and challenge those people who may be perpetrators that are in our midst that we don't know about, I think is a good thing. So at this time, I'm going to let you hear from Russ Funk, who uh, is the co-founder and director of Men's Work. Thank you, Grady. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you all are at. Um, my name again is Russ Funk. I am coordinator for male engagement at the Center for Women and Families. Um, this is I, I did I was a co-founder and director of Men's Work, but a year ago Men's Work merged with the Center for Women and Families, and so now we are a joint Men's Work is a project of the Center for Women and Families, and it's complicated. But anyway, um, 
The Center for Women and Families is our local rape crisis and domestic violence agency serving Louisville and the uh, nine surrounding counties in both Kentucky and Indiana. Um, and my job is to work to engage the men in the, our community to be part of the solution to rape and domestic violence. Um, <clears throat> what we know is that, um, and we all know this, Grady certainly spoke to it from your experience, um, is that rape and sexual assault are pervasive in our communities and in the world. Um, statistics vary. We can argue about what the statistics are, but we know that it is a pervasive and huge problem. We also know that it doesn't just impact on the women who, who are victimized. Um, as we say at the Center for Women and Families, one person is victimized, multitudes are harmed. And it is our job at the Center for Women and Families, it is our job within our church communities to speak out to and address and try and heal all of the levels of harm. Um, so for example, a woman who is raped typically has pe people around her who love her, men and women, or are also devastated by that harm. Again, Grady, you kind of spoke to that in your experience, the, the family of that, of that young woman. Um, and what we know from data and from real experience is that, that the threat of rape in particular has a deep and profound effect on, effect on all women. Women do tremendous things in their lives to avoid doing certain things, dress in particular ways, watch their drink, don't drive in certain areas if they have the luxury of being able to drive all these kinds of limitations that are put in place around how to avoid the possibility or to reduce the threat of being raped. That rape threat is significantly more pervasive than even the actuality of rape. And again, I think as congregations, as people of faith, we are called to, to respond to this, to this global injustice. One of the visuals that we use at the Center for Women and Families is this, uh, for lack of a better word, this, this bullseye. Um, and I like it in terms of this conversation with you all because as faith leaders, you all know how to hold people, pull people into that discomfort zone, but not pull them so far that they shut down. I know from my own experience with, with the, the ministers who have moved me the most, they have moved me out of my comfort zone. I'm lazy. If I'm allowed to stay in my comfort zone, I'm not going to do much. I'm not going to learn much. I'm not going to take action. I'm, I'm happy to stay in my comfort zone. It is when I am pulled out of my comfort zone, but not too far, that I do my, my most growth. We know that on the personal level. We know that on the social change level. Communities or organizations or even countries that are allowed to stay in their comfort zone don't move. We have to strategically, that's what community organizing is all about. We have to strategically move communities in some cases to a level of discomfort so they are then motivated to take some steps and improve themselves. Rape is, by definition, a uncomfortable, challenging topic. And so with this topic, it is, it is a, cha a particular challenge to use a skill set that you all as faith leaders already have because our inherent reaction to the topic of sexual violence is to recoil away from it back to our comfort zone. And what, I want to hope, what I'm hoping that one of the things that you all get out of this, this webinar is how do you keep people in that discomfort zone in a way that, that allows them to feel safe and comforted within that comfort zone in a way that's going to motivate them to make some change. And in particular, I want to focus on those, those, the, the efforts to educate men and boys in our communities. Because what we know is historically and traditionally, those are the folks that tend to be left out of the conversation and out of the solution. So in terms of addressing this, one of the challenging pieces for all of us who do this is that um, there's two definitions that all of us need to keep in mind. I, as an advocate, you, you faith leaders, those of you who do pastoral care, certainly as, as pastoral caregivers, and that is the legal definition, which changes by state. There are some national standards that are pretty consistent, and each state has its own variation within that. And what I'm going to refer to as a victim-centered definition. As I said, I work in both Kentucky and Indiana. And they both have some significant differences by law of how they define and, and understand rape or sexual assault. Um, and I need to have a victim center definition, which is primarily defined by the person that I'm, individual that I may be working with, but also kind of more, more globally focused on how people experience sexual assault, which may be different than the legal definition. 
as an example, in the state of Kentucky, rape is rape is defined as vaginal penetration, which by definition excludes men. So men that I have working with, my job as an advocate is to talk with him around how his lived experience might be. He may define his experience as being rape, but how does he manage that when he faces the legal process that disempowers him from that definition and redefines his experience for him as something other than rape? The penalties are the same. So from a legal framework, it doesn't really matter what we call this, but we all know that from a lived experience framework, it absolutely it absolutely matters what we call this. So again, as, as faith leaders, wherever you are positioned, it's interesting that you know, or you really need to understand what is your legal definition, what is it, what it, what is a working victim de center definition for you? I suggest this one, any forced or one of sexual contact, and how do you manage those two when you're working with people and when you're talking talking about this topic? In terms of talking about rape and rape and sexual assault, um, whether that be from the poor or in other situations where you may be educating, some of the things that I think is important to Keep, to avoid is any kind of subtle or overt victim blaming, um, and that's that takes a, a, a level of consciousness that we're not used to. Uh, we can slip into victim blaming very easily, um, both when talking with people or doing educational work. Some of the more overt forms of victim blaming that we may experience are things like, well, what 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 was she wearing? or how much did she drink, or was somebody watching her drink, or, well, you know, you know what happens at fraternity parties, or fill-in-the-blank parties. Um, those kinds of statements suggest pretty overtly that she had some portion of the blame for what, happened, what was done to her, or him, and I think it's important, obviously, to, to stay away from that. Um, another example of, of victim blaming is the tendency to use why questions. Um, why do you think he did this? Why were you alone with him? One of the things that we've learned from an advocacy perspective is for people's, in, for people's experience, the use of the term why is often translated to what did I do wrong? What did I do to deserve this? And so why, even if intended in the, in the most heartfelt of, of situations, may be interpreted as victim blaming. In terms of that, in talking about this issue and certainly in talking with people who may or have been victimized, I believe it's really important to recognize that they are probably blaming themselves already. They don't need any help with that. What they do need help with is excusing themselves from the blame. So I don't think they can hear too often, there is nothing you did to deserve this. This cannot be your fault. Um, one of the positives of, the, of leading with that kind of opening is that it allows people to say, well, but I did, I did go home with him. I did drink too much. I did, which are examples of the self-victim blaming. And then that allows you as a faith leader, either again in, in an interpersonal situation or in a community education situation, to debunk the, the victim blaming. It's like, okay, so maybe you did drink too much. And so what? Rape seems like a pretty severe penalty for, for drinking too much. The, the penalty for drinking too much is getting a hangover. It shouldn't be rape. Let's put the responsibility where it belongs. Another thing to avoid is making excuses. Again, it can be very subtle to, to, to make excuses. We hear it all the time. Um, men are excused from their behavior because, oh, he was young. Oh, he was drunk. Oh, he was too turned on. Those are excuses. And I think it's important for all of us, wherever we're positioned and talking about this issue, to make to make sure we aren't making excuses for the bad behavior. Um, when talking with someone who has been raped, I think it's really critical to not, not make promises. You're safe now. He's going to be held accountable. We're going to get through this. Okay, that one might be okay. But <laughs> some of those promises, we don't know. Um, what we do know for many people who are victimized is the process of healing this is true for trauma. The process of healing means that you probably are going to start feeling worse before you start feeling better, or you're going to be peri have periods of feeling worse in the process of feeling better. That's what often what healing looks like. And so making, process, making promises that the worst is over now, as an example, maybe it's not, because I'm not the one who's waking up with the nightmares. I'm not the one, the one who's walking down the street and sees some, 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 something that reminds me of the assault. Um, 
So I really encourage you to avoid making promises. And I want to remind you of the power of touch. Um, as you all know as faith leaders, touch is an incredibly healing tool, which can, can also be very harmful. So one of the things that I've employed, for example, when working with someone who's been victimized, is rather than reaching out and holding his hand, touching her knee, I will, in the midst of the conversation, put my hand palm up on my own leg or on the arm of the chair that's next to me. They notice that, that action and um, that, and that gives them the opportunity to decide what to do with that, whether they reach, reach out and touch my hand or choose not to, either way that the message is sent. One of the things that I also want to point out in this conversation when we are talking about rape and sexual assault is that men and women tend to be positioned differently around this issue. Not that they don't care about it, but they are positioned differently. And so one of the things that happens frequently I dare say almost, almost always, is that when we're talking about this issue, a lot of women and some men recognize that we are talking about their experience. So this gives them a first time to label what was done to them as rape. That's new. Many of us are, are, know how to respond to that and how to, when we're doing a presentation, when we're doing some kind of educational content, um, know how to pay attention to who in that room might be experiencing this kind of glimmer of truth and throw a circle around her or him while we're, while we're having the conversation and then reach out to them afterwards. For a lot of men there is a parallel process. When we're doing the rape one-on-one -on -one presentation and talking about what rape really is as opposed to what the, what the myths of rape define it as, there, it is not uncommon for men to, to, to start thinking about situations where we may have used subtle coercion, subtle threats, um, other kinds of tactics to give sex that may get pretty close to what we're talking about as rape. Um, we aren't, as educators, as, as faith leaders, we aren't as necessarily well positioned to support men to go through that process. As an example, one of the, one of the conversation starters that I have in talking with men, and that is the bulk of my work talking with men, is to kind of lean into what I believe to be the truth right now, and that is that for most men, it's not that no means no, it's that no means try again. How many tries again before I have raped somebody? Am I, if I'm making out with a woman and try to unbutton unbu her blouse, and she says, no, she doesn't want to do that, but she stays kissing with me, kissing me, she puts her tongue in my mouth, we start moaning and groaning again, how long before I start to try and untouch, unbutton her blouse again? How, 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 how long before I try and do something? How many second times do I... Do I try something before it becomes a sexual assault? For women in the room, that number is typically less than for men, but you can kind of see what I'm leading to, that, that for men in the room, that may be an aha moment of, ooh, there have been times when I've done that more than once. So in terms of talking with men, I'm going to slip past, I want to just touch on this, I'm aware of time, I want to touch on this real quickly, and talk about how when we're talking about men, it's important to understand that the definition of man is a moving target, um, and this, this notion of masculinity is that there is actually more, more than one definition of masculinity. Um, that definition, those definitions are culturally and socially constructed within the environment, and so as you're thinking about presenting this or, or planning to talk about this within your congregation, within your community, what are, the, what are the expressions of masculinities? How is masculinity defined there? Um, and that the self-definition of masculinity is all, all at the intersection of our various identities. So as an example, I'm white, I'm 50, I'm a parent. My understanding of, of expression of myself as a man is at the intersection of myself as being white, old, self-definition, and a parent, a dad. Um, those, I can't separate those in my understanding of myself as a man. Um, and that's how I express myself. For someone who's 18, his expression and definition of himself as a man is probably going to be significantly different than mine. You all as faith leaders are dealing with all of that in your community. Um, and what this framing does is again position men differently to the issue of rape and sexual assault. What we have done very well in our community of the United States is to position women to be 
victims or potential victims of rape and sexual assault, and men to be either bystanders or, more accurately, potential perpetrators. In terms of trying to talk about this, then, that obviously creates some significant barriers because nobody really wants to be either. Women or men don't particularly want to be victims, and men or women don't particularly want to be perpetrators. And so there's this, again, this natural tendency to want to avoid this topic, and I'm going to re refer back to your, your skill of pulling people into that discomfort zone and holding them there, holding them passionately, holding them with care in that discomfort zone while you talk with them about these difficult topics, these uh, challenging conversations. The other somewhat theoretical piece is understanding that sexual assault is actually, a rape or sexual assault actually exists on a continuum. The way that we, the, the, the general narrative in this country is around rape is to, is to separate it as a violent act that is d distinct from other forms of sexual, sexual assault. I think it's really important that we understand that they exist on a continuum. This, this, this is a, a continuum that I created based on the work of somebody whose name I just forgot, I'm sorry. Um, but it, it positions, it recognizes the connections between subtle forms of gender or sexual harassment and more violent, violent um, forms of gang rape and, and sexualized murder. We know they're connected because if you listen to the voice of people who have been victimized, what we hear is consistently common language around what their experience it was. Powerlessness, feelings of coercion, feelings of self-blame, all of those emerge at whatever level along the continuum that we're talking to people who've been victimized. The difference is the level of intensity, which tends to increase along with the level of violence or threat. And so as you move right along the continuum, you see that top arrow going up, which signifies the level of violence or threat. But that bottom continuum remains consistent. We also know that it's, it's, it's a continuum because if we listen to the voices of perpetrators, which in my mind are the real, real experts on rape and sexual assault, they tell us very common themes. The reason that men perpetrate street, street harassment is not terribly different than the reason that men, that men perpetrate acquaintance rape. Street harassers don't really think they're going to get a date out of that behavior. Just like acquaintance rapists tend to report very low levels of sexual satisfaction out of their raping behavior. This is not sexually motivated behavior. This is power and control motivated behavior. This comes from the voices of perpetrators. If perpetrators understand these as a, as a continuum, and if we understand them as they're the real experts, then, may, then I think it behooves us to listen and recognize that. The other reason I like this continuum is that it points to opportunities to inter intercept it. It is very rare for any of us as bystanders to actually see a gang rape or a marital rape or an acquaintance rape. And so if we understand that as something that happens behind closed doors over in those communities perpetrated by those men over there, then I don't have anything to do about it. But if I understand it as existing on a continuum and these other behaviors I do in fact see and if I can, and I can make the connection around how the sexual harassment and the gender harassment that I see in my world, in my life, is in fact connected to these other forms, more violent forms of, of violence, then that gives me an entree of what I can do and say to interrupt it. I do want to offer a caution around the continuum of sexism. The continuum of suggestion does, sexism does, is not meant to suggest that if a man perpetrates acquaintance, acquaintance rape or is viewing pornography or buying a prostituted person, it is not meant to suggest that he is on the slippery slope and he will then become a gang rapist. There's no evidence to support that. There's no evidence that men move from perpetrating one form of violence to another. There are an awful lot of street harassers that are only street harassers. I don't mean to minimize that by using the term only. Please, please forgive me. Um, what it is to suggest is that in the context in which men choose to perpetrate these forms of violence, the context is a continuum, and the, and the behaviors do support each other. Okay, so there's that kind of that framework. In terms of actually talking about it, um, again, when talking with men, when, when speaking from the pulpit or in your, in your other speaking opportunities, recognizing that men are positioned to have a different understanding of this and a different relationship to this than women. And that men, like women, are compassionate, caring people who are called to justice. There is very little evidence that men or women are more compassionate or more caring or more called to justice. 
The evidence also suggests that there is very little, if any, gender difference between men and women in terms of their understanding of rape and sexual assault as a problem, as atrocious, as, as problematic in our communities. What is, what there, where there is a tremendous gender difference is who's taking action and who's involved. And it doesn't take long to look at any community in any space to see who the leaders are of this work. You go in any take back a night march and you see 150 women and 10 or 12 men who are looking lost for the most part. At the Center for Women and Families, as an example, we have nearly 100 staff, um, do dozens of volunteers. Uh, right now, we have out of the paid staff that we have, like I said, we have nearly 100 paid staff. We have nine who are male. Disproportionately on the prevention team, I, I will add, but it's still a minority of issue. So the challenge of talking with men is not to convince them that this is a problem, mm -hmm. not to convince them that this is an issue of justice or human rights. The challenge is how do we convince them that based on their understanding of this as a problem, as a violation of human rights, how can they then take action to be a part of the solution? As we're thinking about talking about it, one of the things that I want, there's several things that I want to encourage you to, to, to keep in mind. Um, some men in our congregations have experienced sexual assault, and men have different reasons for not disclosing than women. Um, they both have reasons to not disclose, but there are some gender differences around the disclosure. So when speaking in the, from the pulpit or in any kind of community setting around rape or sexual assault, recognizing that some of the men have experienced this as well. Some men, and this is probably the largest, largest portion of the men in, in any congregation, have loved women or men and do love women or men who have been raped. We have done, we as a, we as a country have done a particularly lousy job of creating space for men who love women or men who have been raped to find their voice and talk about what that feels like and how do I address that. Um, and so as part, if I can put this out as your agenda, to look at ways that you can particularly speak to that, that audience. Um, not necessarily as a hierarchy over speaking to the issue as a whole, but as a point of entree, as a point of invitation into this work, um, into working to end and, and respond to rape and sexual assault as a congregation. There's an audience there that you have built in that I think is particularly primed to say yes if you, if you ask them. And then, as I suggested earlier, there are some men in our congregations who have perpetrated rape and never called it, called it what it is. Um, there's a researcher by the name of David, David Lisek who has done some tremendous work, primarily with men on college campus, to identify what he calls and what his book is called the undetected rapist. And the vast majority of those men per perpetrated what, amount, what amounted to a legal violation of rape in, the, in their states or in their, on their campuses, and yet not a one of them defined their behavior as rape. Um, for a whole host of reasons, our own denial and minimal and, the, and the, the legal community and our whole communities minimizing of this issue, men are primed to not understand their behavior as perpetrating. And, and what that means in terms of talking about it is, again, I think is, is to suggest to pull some men into that discomfort zone around, um, I may have been a rapist, I, may have, I thought I got consent, but maybe I, maybe I used coercive tactics. So in terms of engaging men, what we know is that it doesn't do to avoid gender in talking about this. Rape, men, I'm sorry, men understand very well that rape is a gendered crime. We know that women are impacted differently than we are. So there's no reason when talking about it to avoid gender as an issue. It's also important when talking about this issue, and I don't think that's going to be a problem with, with you all as an audience, but when talking about rape and sexual assault, to not, to not blame men. We don't engage people by blaming people. And so if you're trying to engage men, recognize that there may be reasons why men are less active than women, but that has little to do with the men and more to do with the structures that we've put in place that make it harder for men to become involved. As you're talking about this, acknowledge that men are in fact impacted by rape and sexual assault. assault. This impacts all of us. Um, if one in three women are sexually assaulted in their lifetimes, most of us as men love and love deeply at least one woman who has been sexually assaulted. And God calls all of us as, to be our brothers and our sisters keeper. That's not new language for most men, regardless of their, their 
uh, relationship to, to a faith community. And one of the things that we found locally and that is emerging globally is that the easiest way to engage men is to find some solutions that men can be a part of in their church, in their congregation, in their community, as opposed to defining and trying to engage men by defining the problem. And so one of the things that we use in, in, in men's work, in our local work, is the, the tagline, be visible, be vocal. It doesn't really do a lot of good to be a silent, invisible ally other than to yourself because you get to look in the mirror and say, oh, yay me. But part of being an ally is to be visible as an ally, to be visible as a man speaking out against rape, and to be vocal. And our job is to how do we create opportunities and ways for men in our congregations, men in our communities, to be visible about their um, opposition to rape and sexual assault and to be vocal. Some specific behaviors that we encourage men to, to do is start by listening, and by believing. Whenever a woman is raped, there is this huge narrative driven largely by men, but there are a lot of women involved in that as well, that don't believe her, that doubt her sincerity, that question her, her, her reasons for disclosing. There is some real value for, for men believing and believing out loud, every time, all the time, when a woman or a man discloses. And we as community organizers, which I would suggest you all as faith leaders are, um, our position to encourage men to do that and give men tools of how to believe out loud. Um, we are called to, to respect women, and this can come in, in the subtlest of terms. I encourage men to think about those situations where we all hear men talk about women the way men talk about women when, men aren't, when women aren't in the room. Every my, my experience of doing that is not only is he disrespecting women when he runs his mouth, but also, I disrespect women if I don't confront him on his dis disrespect of women. And so how do we create and empower men to feel like they can do, say and do something when women are disrespected in front of him? Basic bystander intervention, if you all are aware of, of that frame. Um, and then also, we encourage men to take action by challenge or care front the men around them. Set a standard of how women are going to be, help men to set a standard of how women are going to be treated in front of them and around them and hold men to that standard. Um, we have a former coach here from the University of Louisville who has um, moved to the University of Texas. And as a coach, I think he's probably one of the best, best examples of being an ally and setting a standard. If you want to play on his team, you will not hit a woman. You will not abuse women. He, and he has gotten in trouble at University of Texas already. He's been there a year for setting that standard and holding his players to it. Uh, uh, he had a, a star player last year who he held out of the game on on Saturday because of the beha behavior that the coach heard from that he that the player did on Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I think that's something that we as men can hold our hold our standards to. Some fun examples that I think are also meaningful. This is an example that the Riverview, Riverview Center is a social service agency in upstate Iowa, and this is a, a a bingo game that they put in, in as an ad in their, their, their local newspaper for Super Bowl that encouraged people to, to, rather than watch the Super Bowl ads for fun, watch them with a critical lens. They did not copyright this bingo game, so you are free to borrow it from them and print it in your local newspaper, print it in your school bulletin, stu, um, sorry, your church bulletin, print it in your church newsletter. Work with your local agency to print a, a version of this and get it out in the community and look at the subtleties. What are, the, what are the messages that are being sent by the commercials during the Super Bowl Sunday? And have people think critically about that, in particular men, but men and women. Um, I'm aware of time. I have some other slides that you'll see and you'll have access to, but I know we have other content that we want to get to for the, for the purposes of this webinar. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Gary and uh, let him say his piece. Thank you, Russ. Uh, there's three things I think uh, from a religious viewpoint I don't want to add to our conversation. The first is as, as Reformed people we claim that we live in, we make covenant with each other and that we live in community and if, if that is true about ourselves then it's, it's true that we are related to each other and that community needs to be able to rise to the challenge of whatever we need to confront in our life, whatever, whoever we need to comfort in our life, whoever gets hurt in our church and we shouldn't be a place where people feel they can't bring their hurtful, painful experiences, especially those who are victimized in rape. 
as part of that community, we also make this audacious pledge, we do it all the time, to raise each other's children, which is uh, sort of unique to us. And in that pledge, we have to really ask ourselves, you know, what kind of children are we raising, especially what kind of uh, young men are we raising? Are we exporting part of that to the, to the culture so that, that we kind of want to give them the, the soft spiritual side but let the rest of the world tell them how tough they need to be and what kind of men they need to be? We need to really challenge ourselves on that. And the third thing, I think this is especially for those of us who, who do preach on occasion, uh, it's a well-worn phrase from prophets on that to preach to power. Well, this is a power mm -hmm. issue, and this is the issue we need to preach to, is, this, is the whole power dynamic that's involved in, in gender relationships and how that power relationship uh, goes very much awry, especially in sexual assault. So the church, there is church work about this issue because it involves people, because it involves our children, because it involves our very understanding of the gospel. And I think we need to find a way to rise to that challenge so that we can be the kind of church and help create the kind of communities that we want to create as a people. Shannon? Thank you, Grady, and thank you, Russ, especially both of you for your, your, your input into this important topic. What I'd like to do um, as just for a few minutes here, as we think about uh, sexual violence and uh, the pervasiveness of it around the world, is to challenge us to think in terms of how we might create some systemic changes as a community. One of the things that we are discovering as um, we work more and more in these areas and in many of the uh, of organizations who are working um, globally and locally is that if we want to make a change to th around this issue, at least two things have to happen. One is both men and women need to work on it together. And the other thing is that those congregations that engage Stopping violence or whatever their particular issue is on a local and a global level allows us to sort of create, to sort of close up that circle of, of work so that we work, we're working on a local issue related to sexual violence. We work perhaps in the Congo uh, supporting our mission co-workers who work with women who have been where 70% of the women have been victimized by the war. So working in, within a congregational context where we help create that mission sense that, that we can no longer live in a world where um, it is us and them, where it's them out there in the Congo or in the Philippines Russia or wherever, and it's us here in the U.S. that we're somehow in a better situation, only allows us to stay away from some of the most important systemic work that we can do. World Mission um, has many mission co-workers, as you know, uh, around the world, and I have a list here of several who are working on this issue uh, globally. These folks uh, come at the request of our, of our global partners there, the global church and NGOs and others who we're working with, and are working particularly uh, around this issue. And I invite you to consider how your congregation uh, might be a part of a movement that helps, that acknowledges that, guess what? We are a part of the world. The U.S. is a part, we aren't, it's not us and the world, it's the U.S., it's all around the world. It's no longer a mission that, that engages, uh, that we go out there, it's that we are complicit in our own ways that we need to look at. We have connections around the world. We uh, get to participate in the world as equal beings in the world. And working with mission co-workers and global partners can be a really um, exciting and effective way to do that. Um, in fact, this in October we are doing a trip to Guatemala and working with SADEPCA, which is a training institute there, um, and our partners there and uh, mission co-workers, Sandy and Brian thompson Moyer and Leslie Vogel, uh, who are working with women um, around this issue. 
other trips that are in, in the works as a possible way for you to deepen your understanding are um, in Congo and in, um, um, in Thailand and Southeast Asia. So you can get a hold of me about that. And the other piece is a, to join a mission network that's a local, uh, a national network of people who are engaged around this issue. And finally, uh, just to tell you uh, just a little bit more about courageous conversations, most of you have received a fair amount of email about this or uh, and a call from Grady as well. So I'm really grateful to Grady for uh, going to bat on this. Um, but in the month of October, we invite you to teach, preach, or have a service of healing um, around stopping sexual violence. And Particularly in that context, we, we encourage you to, to engage the global, uh, the global work that's being done by Presbyterians around the world. We will speak out, um, which is a resource with, within this, um, uh, embedded in this, uh, this presentation, uh, is a great place to go for multiple resources uh, around uh, preaching and teaching. On there, there's a pledge against violence that we are inviting folks to engage in. It's a way to just initiate the conversation. I believe that the ways in which um, the church has been most effective in the world, the ways in which we have been the hands and feet of Christ where we have let ourselves be uncomfortable, as Russ says, allowed ourselves to be pulled into that space, that uncomfortable space to grow deeper, that those, those spaces are the ones that um, make change in the world. Somewhere, someone in a coffee hour, sipping a cup of coffee with a friend, heard something that happened on the news and said, I I can't live with this. We need to do something about this. Is anybody else in? And truly that's what it takes, is one conversation. One person taking that, that risk to move forward the work of God in a way that is, a, is healing. So I invite you to consider doing that um, and to look deep, more deeply into these issues um, I want to let you know, too, that the website, um, which is at the bottom of this slide, uh, pcusa.org slash Courageous Conversations, has many resources on it if you haven't been to that. A new one that went on, um, I believe, today, um, has a, it is, comes from Julie Owens, who is a Presbyterian uh, woman who has done a lot of work around advocacy. Um, um, through the Faith Trust Institute and others, but it's a list of, of sort of do's and don'ts um, for you to uh, think about as you're preaching and teaching from the pulpit or from um, in education hours or with youth or, or with whomever. Um, so I encourage you to use those resources. This webinar will be available um, after um, we do a little, maybe a little cutting and pasting or whatever. We'll be pulling it together and you'll have access to that as well. So I want to open this up to a few more questions. We've had a few come in. We have time to have um, others um, send in and I want, um, and I think I'll just go ahead and throw out a couple of these questions that have come through. Um, so one, one person wanted to know, um, I think this is for you, Russ. Um, is there a reason you use victim instead of survivor? Not so much. Um, I, I think if you noticed, I used victim and survivor, but the term that I most often used was person who was victimized. Um, I frankly don't like either the term victim or survivor when talking about this. I do for a multitude of reasons. In this situation, I don't know who the audience is, so I don't know what language you all are most comfortable with. Um, but victim and or the term victim or survival gets to labeling. And the one thing that I've heard, if there's one thing I've heard from people who have been, been victimized over the past 30 years very consistently is that there is more to them than their experience of being victimized. Mm -hmm. And victim or survivor limits them to that experience. So what you probably heard me say most and will hear me say most is person who was victimized. 
Um, in particular situations, I let the person I'm talking with lead that. So if I'm advocating with a person, if I'm at the hospital with a person, and that person identifies themselves as a victim, I let I let them lead. That is not the moment for me to challenge them and 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 try and move them to a different place. I need to accept them where they're at and just hold them in that space. Great. Um, another question that came through uh, was um, wondering if the slides will be available. And so I guess I, get, I did answer that already. Yes, they will be available. Um, the PowerPoint will be available for you to use. And, and you can always contact me, uh, shannon.beck at pcusa.org or uh, Stephanie Cottle, who is um, my colleague here, um, stephanie.caudill at pcusa.org, um, and we'd be happy to um, uh, respond to you in any way. Um, and then uh, also, if you are interested in contacting a mission coworker, um, that also you can come through my, myself or Stephanie. Uh, we should have put her, her, her uh, email on here, but it's not there. So one other question that came through um, is uh, who should we contact if we'd like to support a mission coworker involved in stopping sexual violence? Um, so yes, if, you're, if this is something you're in, you are feeling like you want to deepen your understanding about, um, you can contact me or Stephanie. Um, I'll go ahead and spell that out for you since we're here. It's S-T-E P H A N I E dot uh, C A U D I L L at PCUSA dot org. Um, she'll be great to connect you with them. Um, so there's the answer to that one. Can I jump in in a moment? Yes. I think another opportunity for mission work, uh, there's certainly the formal missions as Shannon described within the Presbyterian Church, but your local rape crisis center is doing this kind of mission work every day. And I think both in terms of the mission work and in terms of the local work in your community to end rape and sexual assault, that would be a really a critical partnership to try and develop. Um, for, for some of you, depending on where you are located, and I'm assuming that all of you are in the United States, um, there are several states that have statewide efforts to engage men. Um, if you're in those states, I would encourage you to try and hook up with those. Um, those opportunities, if you're thinking specifically about engaging men in this work through your church. Um, off the top, I'm going to run down this list, but you can contact me for more information. But we know of state efforts in Texas, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Ohio, Idaho, North Dakota, Delaware, Alaska, um, New Mexico. Um, so if you're in those states, and there's probably others that I'm not thinking of off the top, but if you're in, if you heard your state mentioned, there is a, there is a formalized um, state effort happening. Another question um, which I, I, I want to get to is um, as a female church leader, how do you recommend I engage male congregants on a practical level? In your experience, are men more receptive when men are teaching them rather than women? My experience is it is a matter of kind, not of substance. Um, if you if you ask, there's there's a fairly limited number of male leaders who are engaging other men in this in this country. Um, the vast majority of us, at whatever level we're be, we we are leading or we are doing this work, we have been brought to this work by women. And so I think there's some real effectiveness that women have in engaging men and promoting male leadership on this issue. Um, I think if we go back to the fundamentals that I that I spoke at around not blaming men, around inviting men as equal partners in the solution um, of, and that can be a challenge of how do you invite men to this in a way that isn't blaming. The other side of that is that sometimes men feel blamed even though we aren't doing blaming. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a tension to walk and I think part of the engaging men work is being open to being challenged and then really being able to talk with men around, tell me, and with, with an open space around, I may be inadvertently blaming. Tell me how I am being blaming inadvertently and that is not my intention. Blame has never been an effective social change strategy. Um, so that is, I don't, that's not how I operate, but 
I'm flawed, so I may come across as blaming when I don't intend to. Um, I think that the key point around that we've learned around the world is that whether it's men or women who are working to engage men, if you give them a how to do it, they're more likely to say yes. I work for a nonprofit. Some of my work is fundraising. The least effective fundraising strategy is asking, Joanne, will you make a donation? If I want to, if I want to effectively don fundraise with her, I'm going to find out a little bit about Joanne, what her, what her interests lie, and how much she has to give. So I can go to Joanne and I can say, Joanne, I know you're interested in this issue. Would you be willing to donate ten dollars? That she's much more likely to say yes to than, will you make a donation? I think the same is true. For our, our, what we're learning is the same is true for, with engaging men. Asking men, will you get involved in this issue, is the least effective way to get men involved. Because most men think this is far removed from them, that it's too big of an issue and I don't know what I could contribute, and I'm going to do more harm than good, so what can I do? If we can get come up with specific asks of the men in our community around what they can do, men in our congregations about what they can do, and then position to support them to do what we're asking them to do, basically empowering them, then they're much more willing to say yes, regardless of who's asking male or female. Yeah, I guess I, I want to throw in there uh, something my sister Simone Campbell said last week at Big Tent, and where she was talking about the issues of poverty in the economy. But basically, what she, the point she lifted up was, yeah, it's it's all a huge, it's a huge, it's a huge subject. First of all, I'll take all of, it, but it's not about me taking all of this on. It's about us taking all of this on. So just find the one thing that you can do and do that to your ability. And if we all do that, then we can make some progress on this. Mm -hmm. One thing I would, would like to leave people with, and Russ brought this up, and um, I should have brought it up sooner, I think. Um, it is really important as you enter into this conversation in October that you engage your local shelter. Expect that when you preach on this, someone's going to come to you. But they have the resources and the support to know how to refer you and and to... to um, be be for you uh, what you need. That I think that's. I remember when I was talking to Russ earlier about this when we were planning this webinar. I, I said, you know, what what do you think it keeps really keeps people from having this conversation? You know, why why are we not having it publicly? And one of the things that Russ said, you know, was that that um, we're afraid of what's going to happen. And and I and I think that that's that's true, but. Um, and that's why it's so important that we, we engage your, you engage your local shelter and or your local women's hotline or whatever your local resource resource is. Um, so I, just, I can't say I can't say that strong enough. Every time I um, speak about this, um, someone comes to me. It's not always their first time, uh, but someone comes to me. And um, so. This, this is an important um, process for you, and it's a great connection to help, um, to help your church community know how to deal with this better. Um, here's another question. Time probably this question, maybe, maybe one more. Um, what would your suggestions for those of us that serve in rural congregations? That's a really good question. I think the most important piece is um, connecting with others. So chances are if there's a clergy uh, coalition in the region or um, if there's a state, uh, if there's a, a local governing piece uh, that you can connect to, that they will want to be keeping um, safe communities for all. Everyone wants their communities to be a safe place. So even if I grew up in a town of well, outside of town of about 500 people, and um, there were the clergy, you know, connected there to try to find, um, you know, things that they need to work on together. So I would suggest that you you work together on this. Yeah, that's what I would say. Any other ideas? I I would totally agree with Shannon. I I think it's particularly in rural communities. It is often the the faith community that is the glue that holds that community together and is that safety net. Where there isn't anything else, um, in terms of connecting on this issue, every state, this, our our access to rape crisis centers vary varies widely in this country, and there are some places in rural rural you the rural United States that has has a difficult relationship 
different di difficult uh, access to rape crisis centers. But every state has a state state sexual assault coalition, and so specifically on this, I would encourage you to get in touch with your state sexual assault coalition, um, find out what resources they might have um, for the rural uh, rural areas of that state, and what what lo what's the local rape local ish rape crisis center that makes um, that makes that, that serves your area. Great. Thank you so much for being here and for your taking this time out of your day. I especially want to thank um, State of Clerk Grady Parsons and uh, Russ Funk for being here with us here. Um, Russ is available if you have more questions for him. His contact information is on here. Grady, of course, is always available. Um, and I'm, I'm here. I would love to connect you with others who are being engaged in this work. Um, particularly around the international piece, but ways I can, any way I can connect you with others um, who are engaged in this work, I would be so happy to do so. So thank you so much, and please I just pray for you to have a blessed day. Take care of those that you love, and thank you for your courage. <laughs>